Thank you very much, Paul. I'm really happy to be here because the discussions are really, really interesting to me. This system level, how do we integrate processes to really uh, exhibit this behavioral flexibility that we observe in, in mammals in general. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about coordination of learning systems, and in particular, uh, model-free and model-based reinforcement learning systems. So uh, I'll try to convince you that this convention can be useful. and. Um, so I come from a team in Paris, which really aims at developing architectures and models of adaptation and cognition. And like many of the, of the people here, we are really interdisciplinary between uh, engineering and neuroscience. So taking some engineering techniques, machine learning, but also robots to try to uh, come up with new computational models and uh, to try to better understand the brain and sometimes going in the other direction, like taking inspiration from what we understand about the mechanisms that and enable this flexibility and try to see if it, they work well in robots. So the, 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 question, the, the, the core of our research interest is really decision making. How an agent, whether a robot or an animal, can decide at any time what behavior to display. So it could be choice between different actions, uh, uh, strategies, movement, depending on the, on the scale. But that's what is needed in general for survival. And most of the time, we focus on solving a particular task. So reinforcement learning, so learning by trial and error, is going to be the, the way to adapt this decision-making process. And most of the time, what we mean, uh, what we have in mind is trying to uh, maximize a particular reward function. And it's, so it's simplistic, but it's, it's going to say that's the sum of rewards you're going to get over time, uh, weighted by how immediate they are. So immediate reward has a higher weight than future rewards. So this gamma uh, discount factor inferior to one enables to, yeah, to give less importance to future reward. And that's the function that our agents are going to maximize. So it's very simplistic. Doesn't mean this function cannot be reached. So when we say reward, that also includes negative rewards, could be punishment. You could even, there are extensions of this work I'm not going to present today with multidimensional rewards. So you could have uh, food as one dimension, but you can have social rewards. Sometimes you need some social feedback. Even information that you can get from the world could be uh, another dimension. So there are different possibilities to extend this. If you're interested, I can send some references, some papers. And also one thing, one very strong assumption we're going to make in all the experiments I'm going to show is we are assuming that the agents, in particular the animals, have a constant motivation for this reward. We suppose that uh, we control sufficiently well the task that they really want this reward all the time. But of course there is society, many different things that here we neglect. And so as I will show you uh, in real world experiments, well, we are facing complex problems. There's the issue of noise, partial representation of states, uncertainty, non-stationarity of the environment, which makes simple reinforcement learning, those with which I will start this presentation, not that efficient. So we are facing the issue of how to modularly, hierarchically organize different learning processes in order to enable this behavior of flexibility and autonomy of decision making. And, and really, the strategy is to look at how this is organized within the brain. So, Roughly, I'm going to talk to you about mother-free reinforcement learning, what it is formally, and how it relates to some brain processes and behaviors, and model-based reinforcement learning. So mother-free reinforcement learning. So I don't know how, much, how many of you are already strongly familiar with uh, temporal difference reinforcement learning. So, OK, so not all of you. So it's still useful to really understand. So I will focus on one equation, the reinforcement how you compute a reinforcement for an agent. So here we have a task with an agent, so it's a small robot, in a, in a plus maze. And the goal for the robot is to move and get to this wall, which is here white, we're supposed to represent a, a, a lit wall. And there it has to stop to, to, have a, uh, to be oriented towards the wall and trigger so, some consumatory action in order to get a reward. This reward is going to be a scalar value, equal to 1, 0 the rest of the time. So why this experiment? It's actually an experiment I was doing during my PhD thesis with real rats, and we accumulated a lot of data. So during the thesis, I also did some modeling and some simulations like this to see if we could reproduce the dynamics of learning observed in the rats. So this robot has some sensors, for example, uh, uh, um, obstacle uh, sensors like uh, infrared or something, and it has some camera to observe just here the luminance degree around it. So that's dark, uh, that's black, that's dark gray, light gray, white, and so on. So now we want this robot to learn 
to efficiently maximize reward. So that means from any starting point, it should go uh, with the shortest path to the reward, and that's how it's going to maximize. So this robot is initially randomly moving, exploring, and let's imagine that after some time, it has performed this sequence of five actions and gets a reward. So how are we, what, what learning algorithm are we going to program to make this robot learn? So one first trivial solution could be to say, well, let's, let's have a, a, an algorithm that stores all the actions that have been performed. If you get a reward, you reinforce everything. So that's a trivial algorithm where the reinforcement signal, we're going to write it delta at time t, is going to be equal to the reward you get from the external environment. So of course, you all see that there are strong limitations here. This agent might need to remember long sequences of actions. Second, the, the agent is not able to evaluate itself. OK, I get a reward, but is it something I know I'm familiar with the environment and I don't want to reinforce all the time, so otherwise the system might diverge? Or maybe it's something novel. I want to really uh, take it into account. So here comes the idea of, of prediction errors. I'm going to, to reinforce when things are surprising, either positively or negatively. And so the idea is, before acting, in the state S where you are at time t, you're going to try to evaluate or predict how much reward you might get in the future. That's this V function. And then you act. So in this second algorithm, we still remember, store all the actions performed. You get some reward, and then you make a comparison. So after n time step at t plus, t plus n, the reinforcement signal is the difference between what you get and what you expected. So it is a reward prediction error, but a minimal one. You still need to remember long sequences of, of actions. And second, in this example, you see that some actions were good, but some were not that good. Like action number two has led the agent away from the reward. So you would like to treat this action differently. It's as if you're playing chess. Maybe you win, but at some point, you could have done a move that put you in a very difficult situation. You don't want to do that again. So you would like to treat each action separately. And here comes temporal difference learning. The idea is to add a third term here so that you do an update, you do a reinforcement after each action. So before doing a given action, you estimate the situation based on what you've learned. So initially, the value is 0 or is something random. Then you do an action. You have a new estimation at t plus 1. And the difference between two consecutive predictions of reward, so a temporal difference, is going to be part of your reinforcement signal. And so here, imagine that the robot has already done a few trials. So it knows, ah, there's some reward to get. So before doing action two, let's say the v is 0 0.5. And then the robot, maybe because it explores, decides to perform action number two and finds itself in a situation, oh, now my expectation is 0 0.2. It's, it's, it's not as good. So I'm in a situation where I still don't get any reward from the environment. So this is 0. But the difference between those two consecutive predictions is negative. And it's going to decrease the probability of redoing this action number two. So I think that's one of the key elements here, because of this third term, you don't only reinforce actions when you get a feedback, Woo! <laughs> but <laughs> no, no problem. But you, uh, you, you do an update uh, after each action. And that's the strength of these algorithms. So let me show you what happens. Oh, and I want to say something more, that this equation if it's then used to update your value, so that's the, the, the equation you use. So the value will be b updated based on the previous value multiplied by 1 minus a certain learning rate. And this learning rate is used to weight your new expectation. And in the end, it's just a low pass filter on your reward expectation. So let me show you with a, a, a pseudo simulation how this behaves. So this is a classical grid, wor grid world where in machine learning people have developed these algorithms. So we have an agent that moves north, south, east, west. We have some obstacles. And here is the goal state. There you get a reward. Elsewhere is 0. Okay? And so imagine the agent for the initially it moves randomly anywhere for a long time. And by chance, through exploration, after some time it gets there. So it gets a reward. It was completely unpredicted. If you initialize everything to 0, so you get something unpredicted positive reinforcement, you update your value. Let's represent this by a color. So increase this color. But then you reput the agent at the starting point, And elsewhere, it doesn't know anything yet. So it continues to move randomly. And if by chance it arrives to these con uh, consecutive states, by chance it decides to go north, Ah, now you're 
you still didn't get any reward, but you're in a state where you, you expect something. So this the value is 0 0.9. And you come from a state where the value va was 0. So it's positive. It was good to go north from here to there. So you get a reinforcement, and you update the value. There you go. Yeah. And now you know what to do. You should go north. You get this reward. But this reward is now partially predicted. So the difference, the prediction error is smaller. So you still update the value, but smaller. And what happens is you progressively build a gradient. That's what you do. But it's very, very, very slow. That's a key feature that you need to remember. This is a model-free reinforcement learning process because the agent is just learning local values. It's not trying to build any mental uh, representation, a model of the structure of the environment. So you need to propagate this very slowly through many repetitions. Second, uh, here we have supposed that the agent is perfectly able to identify each of the states. So when he's in this state number, I don't know, 128, he's not in state number 129. And we suppose here that there's no issue with that, which is a crucial problem. So keep all these things in mind. But still, that's an interesting algorithm because it's something that propagates some reward that you get at the end of an action sequence to things that precede it in time so that you're able to anticipate. And that's exactly, uh, sorry, well, uh, that's exactly what happens during classical conditioning. And there, that's in these type of experiments that people have found out that dopaminergic neurons encode their activity, their physical activity encodes some reward prediction error. So who's familiar with classical conditioning? Everyone. So I don't need to, to tell uh, the details, but the idea is that you have an initially neutral stimulus that acquires some reward predicting value. And so in the experiment that Fred has shown before with monkeys that are just passive, and if you get an unexpected reward, there's an increase in dopaminergic activity. And that's because, I mean, if the model is right, that's because you get a reward, but you didn't predict it. Now, after training, you have a stimulus followed by a reward, and you do this hundreds of times. You see now a positive increase at the time of the stimulus. And the model predicts that it's because now the stimulus enables to, to, to trigger a prediction of reward. While it, this stimulus was not predictable, so this was 0. So you should reinforce. And the prediction from the theory is like, why, why is it useful to send a reinforcement now? Well, maybe because if there are some stimuli before, you can then continue to propagate, and you can build a chain. And some people have done second order conditioning, and you do observe this propagation. Not infinitely, of course, but it, it has been observed. And now at the time of the reward, there's no response anymore, because things are perfectly predicted. So what you get is approximately what you, predict, what you expected. Finally, in the case of omission, after training, the animal is expecting a reward after the stimulus, but gets nothing. So in addition to be frustrated, you see this decrease. And that's the model predicts that it's because you expected something, you don't get anything. So there's a negative reinforcement. And maybe that's a sign that the world has changed. So, so maybe there's, there's a need to adapt to it. So this was a massive discovery. It's already 20 years ago. But, and, and still in neuroscience, is, is, uh, I mean, it's super famous. And everybody is now using reinforcement learning models. So first, people started started to develop basic ganglia models because it's a main one of the main targets, actually the main target of uh, dopamine innovation. And especially some of these actor critic models that have been mentioned before, where in parts of the limbic striatum, or in, uh, we can discuss this, uh, there might be neurons that try to estimate this value, that try to anticipate reward. This would be sent to the dopaminergic system to compute these reward prediction errors. And these reward prediction errors would come back to modulate plasticity so that the system learns to predict better and better. But at the same time, the same signals could be sent to an actor, which could be, for example, in dorsolateral striatum, which would learn to select the right actions. And OK, so many of these models exist. I don't want to go into the details. But if you then try to go uh, into more detailed uh, implementation of what's in, within the basal ganglia and how the nuclei uh, interact, you, you, can, you can raise some novel predictions. And that's what we did with uh, Mark Humphreys and Kevin Gurney. We took their classical action selection model of the basal ganglia with different nuclei. And so it's similar to the models you've seen uh, by Fred uh, also uh, yesterday. And the idea is, if you get a lot of reinforcement signals, a lot of dopamine, phasic dopamine, that accumulates, that means maybe you're doing well. And you can start to 
focus on what you've learned before. You, you can start fo exploiting. But maybe if then, uh, after some time, the world changes and you start not to get positive reinforcement, so the accumulation of these dopamine would decrease, which might indicate that your performance is dropping and that you should re-explore. So in machine learning, this is classically done, for example, uh, by dynamically tuning this beta inverse temperature parameter in a softmax action selection, so that if you have a, an input priority distribution of an action, if you increase beta, you will focus on the action you think is the best at the moment. But if you want to explore more, you should decrease this beta inverse temperature so that you still keep some probability of, of doing other actions. And what we thought with Mark and Kevin was like, actually, in, in the basal ganglia, there is some, uh, some tonic dopamine, which is modulating cortical inputs to D1 and D2 uh, MSNs in the striatum. And maybe that's exactly what we could do, changing this focus. And so we did some simulations, that, and that's what we obtained. So with some input distribution representing the values of different actions, if you have high dopamine, you see the, the output distribution is more peaked. And if you have no dopamine, it be becomes nearly flat. And that could be actually an, an explanation for why it might be difficult in Parkinson to initiate action, because no one is getting above a certain threshold. We even predicted with the simulations that the effect should be mediated more by D1 receptor neurons, not D2. We're still waiting for some experimental validation of this, but actually there was one paper uh, this summer that goes into this direction. So it's, it could be that dopamine contributes to different things. So reinforcing signal, sy synapses for learning, but also modulating action selection. But for how example, would that then link to the, the typical Schultz effect? Right? Because if it's, if it's modulating an interaction between channels, you might expect a somewhat different dynamics of the response then in this very sort of transient, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So, so, so can how change do you, the game of yeah. right? So how do you see these then two these two functions being realized? The so I will show you some models that ah, okay. integrate both uh, later. But of course, I mean this it's, it's a complex question. We do this in a simplistic way, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's an interesting line of research for us. So now let's get back to this story. So we came from an, an algorithm from machine learning, temporal difference learning, uh, which uses reward prediction errors and actually dopamine neurons. Ma their phasic activity seem to encode some reward prediction error. But you can push the story a bit further. Because in Pavlovian conditioning, the animal is immobile. There's no action. What happens if you now introduce some action in the, in the experiment? Do, uh, do, does dopamine still encode a reward prediction error in this case? And is the information carried by dopamine phasic responses action dependent or not? And actually, why this question is, is raised? But it's because in machine learning, actually, you can distinguish different types of Temporal difference algorithm. They all share the, uh, the, the common point that they reinforce based on the reward prediction error. So you see it's the same structure, but they work on different functions. So in the actor critique, it's V is just a value of states, independent from actions. But you could work on the Q function, which stands for quality, <laughs> which is the value of, of particular actions within those states. And that's the case for Sarsa and Q learning. So in Sarsa, what you do, the, your future expectation is based on what you decide you're going to do, so based on action at t plus 1. While in Q-learning, it's sort of optimistic. No matter what you're going to do, maybe you're going to explore and do something with a low value. Your future expectation is the max of all possible values. And so some experimenters have wondered, well, which of these algorithms best, best explains uh, dopamine phasic responses in monkeys doing a task where they have to decide between uh, different stimuli with different probabilities of reward. So this, at this particular trial, the monkey is facing a pair of stimuli, one with 0 0.25 probability of reward, one with probability 1. And the question is at the time of the presentation of those stimuli, what would be the response of dopaminergic neurons? And V-learning would predict that it should not depend on the action, so it should be the same amplitude. Q-learning predicts same equality, but with a higher value that represents the max. And Sarsa predicts that it depends on what the stimulus the animal is going to select. And actually, to, to make the story very, very short, what they found is the amplitude was higher for the higher uh, uh, stimulus with higher probability. So it was consistent with Sarsa. And some other people or other team found other results. And this opened new questions and new debate. And you see, you can go further into using those models to make very precise predictions, test them, and trying to learn better about what is the information encoded by, by those neurons and this system. So from that, and that's going to be nearly the end of this uh, first uh, 
Bart has a talk about model free reinforcement learning, everybody in decision making, at least of neuroscience, is using those models heavily. And people do what they call, and I, I, it's confusing, so I want you to know about it so that you, you're not confused. Uh, they do model based analysis of behavior and your neural activity. And when people say model-based analysis, that doesn't mean they use some model which are themselves model-based, but it means just you're using a computational model to uh, regress on your, on your data rather than simply uh, doing some comparison of different cases. And so for one classical example is you put humans in an fMRI, they do a task where they have to choose between different options, left and right, they have some probabilities of reward, so these are different trials you can imagine. What you can do is use those reinforcement learning models, you fit them to the behavior, and once you find the parameters that best explain the, the behavior with a maximum likelihood approach, so there some, there's a Bayesian framework to do that, you can extract some time series of the different variables in the model, and you can use them as regressors of brain activity to see whether some part of the brain Co uh, activity correlate and might then you could say contribute might to encode something similar to this type of information and this can be done with neurophysiological recordings in animals and so on. So uh, just one point is with. Very quick, you know, so I, I would like to understand this. So we have an fMRI. You do a whole brain analysis. Well, usually it's, it's vo uh, voxel by voxel. But then you, you, but do you don't have region of interest, you go for all the voxels. Yeah, it depends. You have either you have prior hypothesis and you say, well, I'm going to look at this region of interest and within there I want to see test some, some different hypotheses. No, but like in your in the paper you mentioned there, yeah. right? Where you where you really try to extract the reward prediction error from the fMRI signal. Right? So how how, how was it done in that specific case? Well, uh, what and it was reward prediction error, action values and different uh, variables in the model, but then um, there was a whole brain analysis that was done by Stefano Palminteri based on the models that had optimized on behavior. Uh, and of course, you need to do some intermediate cross processing and some filters. And then what you look at is which are the voxels that correlate with this particular regressor compared to another one. And you can use GLM, so general linear models, with different regressors, look at the collinearity between different regressors, and, and so on. So, what's the error you have in that, in that model fit? How accurate is the model fit? So actually, so for the uh, usually you find uh, huge uh, correlations of, to error in vertebral strata in a quite large area. So it's interesting. It's not just one voxel here, one voxel there. Yeah. You have a whole region uh, coherently correlated to that. Usually, it's quite strongly correlated. I'm, because I'm not doing those correlations directly with fMRI, I cannot tell you the order of magnitude. Yeah. When I work, for example, with monkey neurophysiological recordings, mm -hmm. you get some super small p's. I mean, you, you find some neurons that really strong correlation. Okay. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Depends on what, what you're saying. Then, of course, other variables, sometimes you, you know, you, because of corrections for multiple comparisons and so on, you don't find significant correlations. Mm -hmm. right. it's, it's a whole field by itself, a whole technique of first, well, model fitting, optimization of parameters to fit behavior. Model comparison, because it doesn't mean, even if you fit this model to this behavior, doesn't mean it's a good model of the behavior. So you need to compare. Say, you have an alternative model, and one is better fitting than the other. Uh, so we have, uh, there's, a, there's a whole Bayesian uh, model comparison framework. I mean, if you're interested, I can send you papers about that. And then there's a whole technique about how you use the regressors and so on. But it's good for you to know that with your training, actually, uh, experimental neuroscientists are super interested in, in what you can do and in collaborating, exchanging data, uh, doing correlations like this. So that's one possibility. Okay, let me finish this part on model free by saying, well, okay, it looks like a nice story, but there are limitations. I've mentioned a few, but it's still very simple models. Most experiments were in neuroscience, when they use these models, are single step experiments. You make a decision, you observe the feedback. Well, as you've seen before, it's supposed to be something to learn sequential decisions. So there are some exceptions, like the two-step task, which is now becoming, becoming super popular. But also, the, the states are discrete. There's a very small number of state and actions. We have supposed perfect identifications. So there are many limitations that you have to keep in mind. And actually, in parallel, applications of this type of models to robotics initially gave disappointing results. Even myself, I did some experiments, and it's so very slow learning. You converge to local optima. Even sometimes you have learned something, and the robot is displaying something. But because reinforcement learning is constantly continuing, some perturbation, and you unlearn part of what you've uh, obtained. And in many uh, uh, papers, people introduced the need for human demonstration 
to simplify the exploration process initially to show the robot what, what type of movement or trajectory it should learn around. So it's not completely satisfying. So here comes, I think, model-based reinforcement learning as a complementary learning process and, and, and which could uh, help overcome some of these uh, limitations, but with its own disadvantages. And the main the take home message for me is that I think the brain is coordinating learning processes which could be well modeled by this dichotomy. And part of our flexibility is our ability to autonomously shift between one another because each has some advantages, each has some disadvantages. So let me talk about this idea of, of when you build a model of the world, of course, approximative, partial, and so on, well, you can close your eyes and you can think about what would happen if you were to take some actions in the world, you would end up in some state. So you can man do some mental traveling and, and you can deduce things, you can bootstrap learning, and we think that hippocampus and prefrontal cortex is contributing to that. So Alex uh, Frederick Alexandre has shown some things along these lines. So remember I told you model-free reinforcement learning is super slow to learn, so people thought, how, how can we bootstrap this? But actually, if you have the agent use its internal model and simulate itself uh, playing in this model, for example, during sleep, well, maybe when you put then the agent back to these experiments, it would be better than if it was just the end of learning, uh, what it, the value function it had learned at the end of day one. So that's the idea. And in machine learning, there are things like with the arch Dyna architecture that implements exactly this idea. And so formally speaking, when we say in, in reinforcement learning, where people say model-based, that means it's, it's when you explicitly manipulate those two functions, the transition function and a reward function. So in the, the other case, there is a transition and a reward function that, that rules, that decide how the world is, is, is working, but the agent is not trying to manipulate them, not trying to learn them, not, not given these functions. So the reward function is simply a sort of memory of which state action couples are associated to reward in the world. And the transition function is something probabilistic that says, for each state action couple, what is my probability of ending up in different states? So you build a sort of graph. And so in the case of navigation, it could be like a cognitive map. And so using this model, according to the words of Sutton, is like, well, you first incrementally learn this model of transition and reward functions, and then you can plan within this model by updates in the head of the agent. So in the case of navigation, this learning process is very different from model-free reinforcement learning. So imagine you have a water maze and an agent exploring. Without any feedback, you just, with latent learning, you can just build this, this graph, this cognitive map. And then once you introduce reward, like for example, a hidden platform where the animal can relax, well, the agent can, can plan and can say, well, I'm here. This is a reward, so I'm going to propagate and do some, to find the shortest path in a graph. One issue, one limitation with this strategy is like, it, it produces slow decision making. If, if the world is big, you need a lot of time to really find your shortest path, to, to plan. But one advantage is, like, is, is, is that you can adapt very fast to a change in, in the environment. So for example, if this platform is moved from here to here, one trial is sufficient for the animal to experience the absence of platform here, or presence of platform, then you update your graph, you retake some time, so it predicts what Diogo mentioned, vicarious trial and error, to then rethink about all of this, update your values, and then you can immediately have an, an appropriate behavior. So that's the advantage. What kind of neurotransmission do you need to build these mental maps for the rat to find the So in all the work I'm presenting, I'm doing this really at the algorithmic level. Okay. But then you could imagine that just having uh, attractor states and you, uh, you, you, you move between attractors, I mean, there are different ways of implementing. I, I think it's... A, oh, oh, I'm okay. I don't want to down all the difficulty of it. I think it's a whole field by itself, how you neurally implement a model-based system. But I'm not working on that. So that's, that's the interest. And so now you have two strategies, for example, for navigation. If we stick to this example, you can do some model-free reinforcement learning, which is interesting because you can make an instantaneous decision. You just compare a few values. It's very fast, so you have very small, slow re reaction times. But when the world changes, you need to locally relearn things. And for a long time, you will be attracted by the previous reward location. So it's slow uh, adaptation. Uh, on the other hand, you have model base, which is much more flexible, but it's computationally costly. And it takes time to remake really decisions. And so we have 
uh, applied this to many different uh, experiments. And we, the interesting thing, you can not only explain changes in performance of humans, monkeys, rats in different tasks, but you can also uh, well account for changes in decision time. And so, for example, this vicarious trial and error, why the model should stop at some moment to restart thinking, you can, that's one hypothesis that you have switched back to model-based and that you're doing this inference process. Um, whoops. So let me, uh, how much time do I? Well, in the navigation case, model-free could also link to egocentric and model-based on allocentric, but you didn't mention that here. So you don't no. see that necessarily linked? Or so that's a complication me, you would like to ignore for now. Yeah, I wanted to ignore it, but I can okay. say a word. We, we wrote a paper with Mark and Fries where we propose that it's actually orthogonal. Mm -hmm. Because you can do mother-free allocentric things. So that's exactly what you said. The hippocampus could just provide information about what the state where you are. And actually, this strategy is allocentric. Your states are really allocentrically defined. And it will be, and sometimes it can be more flexible than mother free egocentric, but you don't have the flexibility that you have when you have a model. We should discuss that. And you can do a model based egocentric strategy too. And there are sure. some evidence for this too. Sure. So for me, it's sort of orthogonal. That depends where, so, but, but most of it, so, and we predict that actually you should see, for example, in dorsal lateral stratum and so on, some spatially correlated activity, but mother free. And, 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 and I'm not sure, well, we can talk about it later. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really understand the model free egocentric. Uh, model, but okay. I don't think you, you will be able to realize that, but okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to discuss this as well. So let's get back to, to, to neuro, uh, neurobiological data, and in particular the hippocampus. So you heard of it, so how many of you know about the hippocampal place cells? Nearly, uh, not, not everyone. So these are neurons that respond for the current location of the animal. So. You see an example of four neurons here, illustrated, when the animal is running on a track. And this neuron is responding only at this position and not other positions. And, vice, and you have other neurons for other positions. And the, the bottom plot, each, uh, each square is the recording of one neuron. And the color shows the, the receptive field. So you, for example, this it's, it's a square arena where the animal has moved. And so you have some neurons that respond at the bottom right, some uh, in the center, some at the top. Some are not selective. They respond everywhere. Some respond nowhere. They even have some neurons with two receptive fields. But as a population, uh, we think that they encode some special information. Well, the interesting thing is those neurons not only respond when the animal is behaving, but also when the animal is immobile, for example, during sleep. And the first evidence for experience-dependent uh, information that is reactivated during sleep was, to my knowledge, this paper by my, Matt Wilson and Bruce McNaughton. They have recorded hippocampal neurons uh, during a moment where the animal is running on some, on some maze. But you have a pre-sleep a pre period and a post-sleep period. Each dot here is representing one recorded neurons. And the uh, lines represent some correlation of activity between pairs of neurons. And so the thickness of the line represents the strength of the correlation. So you see there is some initial pattern. But then during the task performance, there's a new pattern emerging. And visually, that's what is interesting with this plot. You see that during the sleep after, this pattern is reactivated, and which is, was not present in sleep before. And, and then people have done recordings further. You can record a lot of these neurons and see how sequentially they encode information. But this doesn't happen only in the hippocampus. This is communicated to the prefrontal cortex. So these are about 10 years later, still in the group of Bruce McNaughton. But these are neuro multiple unit recordings in the prefrontal cortex. And so here, this is one recording, RAT1 session 13. This is another recording, RAT2 session 7. For each of those, you see the pre-task sleep, task performance, post-task sleep. And each line represents one recorded neuron. So you see here 200 neurons, or here 110 simultaneously recorded neurons. And so they have been organized so that you can visually see the sequence of activation when the animal is running. So they really accompany the, the sequence. But you see that this sequence is reactivated during sleep after. Now look at the time scale. For me, it's fascinating. Here, the sequence takes eight seconds. But during sleep, it's just one second. So as if this sequence is replayed much faster. And so people think, well, maybe that helps to cope a little bit better with constraint of molecule, molecular constraints and so on. Well, still one second is huge. But it also illustrates the fact that when you think about doing something, you don't have the physical constraints of really moving. So it doesn't take time. It doesn't cost at least 
physical energy, it costs mental energy, and so you can do things faster. I, it makes me always want to think of some example. I'm sure it happened to you. Sometimes you wake up in the morning, you look at the clock, but you're still tired, you fall back asleep, you make a long dream, you're traveling and so on, then you wake up again, but it's just one minute or something. I think, well, it's, 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 it's non-science to say these stories, but I think it illustrates this process. And maybe when we dream, time might be compressed. OK, and, and actually, this doesn't happen all the time uh, in permanence in the hippocampus and so on. They are discrete events. So you've mentioned the sharp wave ripples, which are fast oscillation between 100 and 250 hertz. So you see those, those bursts. And when, I mean, well, those oscillations, and when there are those oscillations, many neurons are reactivated. Uh, simultaneously. So this is, for example, one recording. And if you zoom in, you see that they are reactivated in sequence. And sometimes it's the same order as what the animal has experienced. So it's called a forward sequence, forward order. But sometimes it's a reverse order, which is also fascinating. Fascinating. Why? And a lot of people have thought, well, maybe it's like mother-free reinforcement learning, because you want to propagate reward information to states that precede in time. Now the question. Uh, is do these oscillations have a causal impact on, on learning? And actually, they do. If you suppress them, you impair learning performance. So this was done in Paris, a group of Michael Zugaro, in an eight maze task where the, the animal has to learn every day to do just three trials, so three choices. He has to find the arms that contain some food, so those three here. But after a few trials every day, uh, the animal is put in a pot to, just to sleep and is recorded in the hippocampus. And each time one of those sharp wave ripples is detected, a small microcurrent is injected to perturb it. And of course, you could say, well, if I inject currents, I'm just uh, impairing everything. So maybe that's not the, the, the real causal effect. So what they also do, they have a control group where each time there's a sharp wave ripple detected, they wait around 50 milliseconds and they inject the current so that it's outside the ripple. And what you see here is the, an index of performance, days after days. Sorry, it's the French version of the curve. But you see that normal animals in, in blue and the control group on the right in, in black don't have a different performance. But this group, where they have suppressed those sharp wave ripples, learns slower. And to me, that's striking. It's not like they don't learn. And that's not something mentioned in the paper. But they learn slower. And for me, it might be an indication that one learning system, maybe model base, has been disturbed. But you still have your basic model free, slow learning that is happening in the background. OK. And another example of reactivation, something you mentioned. So those uh, forward sweeps, when an animal is hesitating at, for example, a decision point in a multiple team maze, so those vicarious trial and error. And Dave Reddish and his colleagues have recorded activity of many uh, hippocampal neurons. And when they decode, they try to decode what is the, um, the position that is encoded by this uh, population activity. You observe it during a window of 0 to 600 millisecond. And you see that it, so the circle represents the position of the animal. And you see that it's as if the activity is going in one arm, again in the same arm, and then the other arm. And at some point, the animal is, this, uh, is moving. So it's fascinating. Maybe we are recording some mental traveling or planning ahead process. So I just want to mention that there's two, I mean, there's two papers, but with the same ID that were published at the same time, to propose a theory about, about that. Uh, of course, uh, Nathaniel Do uh, in the American team have published in Nature Neuroscience and we published in J Neurophysiology. But they've gone further into trying to give some normative perspective. Why is it useful in the first place to do some replay? And how uh, should we prioritize which states should be reactivated during the replay? And we done something more like a review of many machine learning algorithms to see which one best explain hippocampal activity. But we arrived to the same idea that algorithm that, uh, that the goal of replay might be to have your action values converge faster and stabilize. And that uh, you should give a priority, for example, to, uh, to surprising events in the world or to states associated with uncertainty. So I don't think I will go into the details, but for example, this is just to show you one simulation. And we have a model-based system and what, in a multiple team maze. And the color shows how much time was spent by the model, by the agent, stopping and doing some replay. And you see that the majority of these replays occur at reward locations, because that's where the surprising event happens, the first time you get a reward, or the first time there's a mission of reward. Uh, and 
also in the central arm where you have to make decisions and where there's high uncertainty. And this co is this completely an emerging property of the model. In the Matar and Do model, they force the system to do replay either before the beginning of the trial or after the feedback. Well, here it's emerging from the, from the system. A second thing that I'm not showing is like those replay don't happen during the whole task. Uh, once the animal has found a good strategy, there are nearly no replay in the, in the simulated model. But each time you change the, the task, for example, the reward was there for 100 trials, and then you put it on the other side, then there are surprising events, and the model stops to redo some replay, which we think could be a good model of vicarious trial and errors. So I'm coming to the last part of my talk. So how much time do I still have? Perfect, OK. Don't hesitate to tell me uh, like when I have three minutes left, please. Okay, thank you. So the main message I told you before for me is like I think the brain is coordinating in an online manner different learning processes, and I think they could be well. I mean, some of these could be well modeled as a coordination of model-based and model-free reinforcement learning. So I'm showing you this slide that Frederic showed you earlier, which are instrumented conditioning tasks where an animal learns to press a lever to get some food delivered here. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is that when you have, um, uh, so you have a training phase, and the animal is doing this many times. And then there is a devaluation experiment. So for example, you give the animal in his home cage gets too much food, and he's completely satiated. And you put the animal back into the box. If the animal has been moderately trained, it will press a few times, but then stop. And the hypothesis is like, by Nathaniel Doe, Yael Niv, and Peter Dayan is maybe the decision making is driven by some model based process where there's an explicit uh, representation of different states and transitions between the states. So, in the initial state, if I directly put my head in a magazine, there's no reward, so I should rather press the lever to arrive in a state where the food is delivered, and then I enter the magazine, I get some reward. But I'm satiated, I don't want reward anymore, so I should not do that. But if, with overtraining, if the animal does this for hundreds of times, even after the evaluation, the animals will continue to press the lever. And the hypothesis is that there has been a switch of control of behavior to a mother-free system which just locally learns values. And so the value of pressing the lever is high. So I should continue to press it. It's completely automatic, habitual behavior, as uh, you mentioned, Frédéric. But this is, I think, a general process. Like in navigation, you mentioned again. So the first time, usually, you go to a, to a city you don't know. You look at a, a representation, a model, and you say, well, my hotel is here. A BCBT uh, uh, location is there. So I should take the tram, then turn left, and so on. And when you're in the city, and you say, well, oh, no, the tram station is there. I thought I had turned left. You can close your eyes and think of what you should have done. But during your everyday life, because you've repeated many times the same path, especially the students here, well, you don't do that anymore. You just walk, and you can sometimes you're not completely awake, and you continue to dream, and still your body will turn at the right place. Or you can t talk with somebody, and still you will, you will arrive there. Sometimes some bad consequences happen, like you have an appointment to a new place, and you have to be on time. You start dreaming, and you find yourself in front of your house. Maybe I'm the only one to whom it happens. <laughs> Never. But <laughs> but still, so we think there has been a switch from, so initially people called goal-directed navigation to habitual navigation. And it can, it can be modeled as a switch from model-based to model free. But same thing for, I don't know, you learn to play music or to, and you play the piano, you're playing a concert, thinking about, well, maybe I should put this finger here, could be fun, it's the best way to, to, to fail during your concert. You should rather completely have things automatized. You learn to do some sports, some martial arts. You repeat the same movements thousands of times until they become completely habitual. Uh, you, you build, uh, you sculpt, you, you're scul uh, yeah, you, you do sculptures and so on. Same process of, habit of automatizing uh, things. So let me show you uh, a model that we have developed which combines model-based for navigation and model-free, plus an external Exploration strategy, I'm not going to detail here. Uh, and so you could think this is at a really systems level, and it's, it's sort of hybrid. Like we have a detailed model of the hippocampus with ontorhinal cortex, but for example, these are the parts. We consider that it's part of the basal ganglia loops, but without uh, having a neural implementation. And each of these strategies proposing this, the decisions, but we have a meta controller, which we think is, is something that could uh, be well ex describe what happens in the medial prefrontal cortex in rats, which 
also learns uh, in interaction with, uh, of course, with part of the striatum, also learns for reinforcement, but not to select directions of movement, but to select between those systems. So to select what is the appropriate learning strategy. So here is the exploration strategy. The planning, uh, yeah, the, uh, D is for direction, so that the model free strategy, and the P is the planning from the model based system. And it's learning in parallel to each of these learning processes. And with this type of models, you can explain some uh, interesting data in rats that have been not well explained before. So, for example, this is a Maurice Water Maze, quite an old paper, but it's a Water Maze where the hidden platform is moving every four trials. So the rat has to constantly, constantly readapt. And what they did in the experiment, is they have control rats and rats with a hippocampal lesion. So what the curve shows you is the escape lat latency, how much time it took for the animal to reach the platform, sessions after sessions. And the thick line is the first trial, and the dashed line is the fourth trial. So what you first have, uh, what is very interesting, is when control animals have a sharp improve in performance between the first and the fourth trial. But this is not possible with hippocampal lesion. You see the performance at first and fourth are nearly the same. So you get, with hippocampal lesion, you don't enable in this task this fast behavioral adaptation. But now, interestingly, if you look at the performance at the first trial, the hippocampal lesion uh, animals in green are better than control animals, which is sort of paradoxical. But here, the explanation would be that the hippocampus, because it's also contributing to spatial allocentric representation, is leading animal, the animal to the previous platform location, so it make it, making it lose time. While with hippocampal lesion, at least in the model, what we have is a model that relies more on visual cues, and so you go, you learn, you, you, you go faster to, uh, to follow the cues. And now, interestingly, what you have is also a session by session improvement of performance. And in the end, everybody's converging to approximately the, the same performance, which means maybe the brain of these animals has learned that in the end there is some strategy that is the best in this task. And we can roughly, uh, roughly still not completely perfectly, but it's, to my knowledge, the best account of this data uh, account for this with, the, with our model. And in the paper, we have simulated many other tasks uh, and shown uh, that it, it best accounts. Then we have done lesions in the model of different parts to try to do some novel predictions and so on. But it's just to show you uh, examples of, I think, phenomena that might show this progressive shift from one learning strategy to another. We have put this in a rat robot that was the IKEA project, also to try to convince roboticists, uh, I don't think we've succeeded <laughs> yet completely, but to say, well, rather than in engineering putting one learning strategy like planning in a robot and designed specifically for a task, it might be good to have a system that has different learning strategies and autonomously finds which one is appropriate. And so, for example, in our experiments, it was, so it's a camera from the ceiling. It was the equivalent of a Maurice Water maze in the open room with cues and so on. If you have just the planning from the model-based strategy, because the learning was noisy and the animal maybe, uh, the ro robot spent maybe here less time exploring this part, its model is approximative here while it's good there. So the planning strategy will say, well, go there, but then it doesn't find the reward and the robot is losing time. So you see this trajectory losing time. But if you combine the two systems, this is completely emergent. We didn't tell the, the, the system how to solve the task. Well, the, the model after learning learned that you should plan to go roughly in this area and then use the, sorry, the model free strategy to use the visual cues to, to precisely reach this, this rewarding point, which is not visible. It's a dot for us, but it's, there's nothing visible. It's the cues outside that help the robot learn. So it shows that it has some interesting uh, properties to combine different learning systems. Last experiment that I wanted to show you, because uh, I promised in the abstract I'm going to talk also a little bit about Pavlovian conditioning. And we think that in this paradigm also there might be combination of learning processes. So this was the learning, uh, the, the PhD thesis of uh, Florian Le Saint that you see up there, to try to account for data that uh, are uh, recorded from our colleagues, uh, Shelley Flagel, Terry Robinson, uh, in rats in, in a Skinner box, but it's, it's a Pavlovian task. So what you have is a, a CS that is presented. And here it's a, it's a lever. Sometimes it's a, it's a light. And the animal uh, in the experiment don't need to do anything. But after eight seconds, the lever is going to be retracted. And there's going to be food in the magazine up there. So, and they do this for many trials. What is interesting is that you observe inter-individual variability. Not all the animals have the same behavior. So you have 
what is called sign trackers that are attracted by the stimulus, the sign of uh, upcoming uh, reward. And you have the goal trackers that go directly to, the, to this uh, goal location. So let me show you some videos. Uh, well, it's supposed to be here. So this is a sign tracker. You will see the lever appearing. And in the bottom, you will see the fast can cyclic voltammetric recording. So that's a uh, recording of uh, dopamine innervation to the ventral striatum. And uh, you, you will see it occurring. So this is after learning. So whoop, the lever is, is presented, and you see pff, big bursts. So that's classical dopaminergic response to the CS. Now the lever is going to be retracted, no response, and the, the, the animal gets a reward. Okay, so these animals are attracted by the, the sign, the CS, and you see that the dopaminergic activity is classical, reward prediction error. Um, yeah, we'll do this probably. OK, now these are goal trackers. So the lever will appear on the other side. And again, look at the fast current cyclic voltammetry. Maybe it's. So you see, at the time of the CS, there was a small increase, but not that much. And now the lever is going to be retracted. Up, and now you see this big response to the reward delivery. So as if the, the dopaminergic signal has not well propagated from the reward to the CS. And so people thought, like, wow, it's interesting. This reward prediction error hypothesis is not true in all individuals. So to make the story short, uh, so, well, I think you understood. Our idea hypothesis is like, actually, the brain of those animals is coordinating different learning systems that here we model as model-based and model-free. And different animals rely more on one system compared to the other. And the model-free system relies on dopaminergic reward prediction errors, so those delta I've shown you before. But the model-based system can learn independently from it. So second, we have integrated this thing that dopamine is also modulating action selection, so this exploration-exploitation trade-off. So notice that here it's really an, an abstract model. So we could say this is our basal ganglia. For super, so the integration of, of input and then decision-making. And that would be interesting to then combining combining it with a more detailed model and see what, what is the dynamics. But here, we, because we were more interested in what's happening in terms of learning in the two systems. And we simulate these models, and we, we, we show that this combination, compared to different alternative models, can explain uh, uh, behaviors of these animals in different tasks, uh, physiological, so the dopaminergic signal, and also some pharmacological manipulation, like in uh, antagonists to the dopamine receptors and so on. But the interesting thing, when, once you have a model that explains some experimental data, is to make some novel predictions. And that's what we did. We said, well, if the model is right, actually, I, 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 I'm, I skipped some details, but just roughly to understand the story, we said, well, if you change a bit the protocol, and here the duration of the inter trial interval, the time between the trials, you should actually restore the reward prediction error dopamine patterns, even in goal trackers. So we did some simulations to put forward this hypothesis. And actually, this has just been verified. So it's a paper published by uh, last year with our colleagues at uh, NIH and University of Maryland. They did this experiment, the same sign trackers, goal trackers experiment, but they changed the ITI. So on the left, 120 seconds long duration. On the right, 60 seconds short duration. And what you see, so in, in the short duration, you see that with learning, so from early sessions to late session, the dopamine signal decreases at the time of the US. And this is true even in the goal trackers. This is smaller than this. While if you increase the ITI, now you, you, you force the response to US to be maintained. And this is also true for the sign trackers. So that shows that it's not only an intrinsic difference between individuals, but it's also the environment that also plays a role into uh, driving some of the behaviors and neural activity. So it shows you how we can continue to this level of uh, interaction, whether using the models, predicting things, doing experiments. And our colleagues were kind enough to accept to the experiment, really, which was predicted by the model. So let me summarize. So I, I've talked to you a lot about dopamine, with this idea that phasic dopamine might encode a reward prediction error. Uh, and that but while tonic dopamine might integrate with a slower time scale those reward prediction errors to have some indication of the performance side the average reward that you get. And this could be used to modulate decision making, to modulate exploration, for example. I've told you that based on this story, 
in this neuroscience of decision making, a lot of people currently are using th these type of models, fitting to their data, um, designing new experiments to test some other predictions. But I've also told you that reinforcement learning models have also some strong limitations. And some ways that I've tried to sketch here to try to overcome those limitations, the idea of multiple parallel decision making and learning systems. The idea that if you have an internal model, those transition and reward functions, you can do some offline processes to bootstrap learning. And also this idea that you can coordinate them online, give the hand to one another, which could go under the umbrella of meta-learning. I've not talked at all about this. And this seems to be good promising ways to account for neural activity and behavior in Pavlovian conditioning, navigation, instrumental conditioning, and different tasks. Thank you for your attention.